You. Colonel, this is Dr. Robert Lai, head of the German labor front. You're Albert Speer? Yes, sir. What's wrong with this man? His mind is not what it used to He's be. He's an old drunk. It finally caught up with him. I said shut up! Who was Robert Lai? And why is he important in the story of Nuremberg? Ambassador Delaboys will shed some light. Now he'll return to with Dr. Robert Lai to walk past a group of the German labor front, the Deutsche Arbeitsfront. These are the young men who were incorporated into a national labor front which um, supplanted the labor unions. The National Socialists disbanded the labor unions, replaced them with this national labor front, organized, uniformed, military in bearing, headed by Dr. Robert Lai who committed suicide just before he was going on trial at Nuremberg. And uh, Hitler's greeting these young people. Lai is the fellow to Hitler's left, just behind him, short fellow. Um, he had lots of titles, Reich leader and other official titles, but he was also called the Reich drunkard because he was a notorious drunk. When he died and an autopsy was done, they found strange platelets on his brain, which may have accounted for his peculiar behavior. But he was very powerful and very interesting within the state. Here's his young men. Hitler finds one that he's found of interest and the others look back and Hitler takes a personal moment to talk to this young boy uh, which would have uh, remained with that fellow for a long time. So now he's uh, dismissing them. He's going to uh, get into his car and he's going to depart from this ceremony in central Nuremberg and we'll see the car drive off and in the car will be Dr. Lai and the balding head of Julius Stryker. As you know, my role at uh, my cover at Ashcan in Mundorf was, uh, of course, to pretend to be the welfare officer. Not only pretend, but I actually did it. And that gave me the opportunity to go into uh, each prisoner's room whenever I felt like it. And they all knew me. Uh, as you know, I didn't uh, use my proper name. I went by the name of Gillen. John Gillen, because I still had relatives in Germany. I was almost like a little boy. He had been uh, a navigator in World War I, and his plane was shot down over France. And in the process, he suffered a severe head injury, with the result that he was in a coma for a couple of weeks. And when he recovered, he found that he had a very serious stammer. He stuttered when he spoke. And the first time he came into my room for an interrogation, uh, the routine opening for an interrogation was, uh, wie heißen Sie, what is your name? And then what is your title, your occupation? And he started out uh, stuttering, Robert, uh, and I, I thought he was pulling my leg because I'd heard him speak on the radio and he had been uh, a very uh, rabble rouser, but a very eloquent uh, rabble rouser. So I thought he was just being a smart aleck, and I reprimanded him. I said, you know, talk properly. And he got all red in the face and, and finally uh, told me that, uh, about his injury in France and so forth. And then he rather wistfully said if I could give him a, uh, a shot of that good American bourbon, uh, that would loosen his tongue and he'd be able to talk more fluently. Well, in the course of of this relationship, I found that uh, he was really an alcoholic, and the other prisoners would tell me that whenever Lai got up to speak in public, he was drunk. I mean, otherwise, he, his stammer would have been very pronounced. Uh, he found me very sympathetic, with the result that when we transported all of the, the prisoners to, Luxembourg, to uh, Nuremberg from Luxembourg, we had a special airport, because there was no place that uh, the C-47s, we had two of them that came up from, from uh, I think, from Spain that we had ordered to take the 19 high-ranking Nazis from Luxembourg to, to uh, Nuremberg. I went to Nuremberg, <coughs> and I went to Oberursel, Germany, which is a military intelligence service center. And I had been there, oh, probably about two or three weeks. Uh, supervising a study of the German general staff. When uh, the commanding officer, uh, Colonel Philp, called me in, and he had a letter written in pencil, 
addressed to Mr. First Lieutenant Gillen, Honorable uh, Lieutenant Gillen, I have an important revelation to make uh, which will obviously affect the outcome of the trials and have much to do with the future of Germany. I trust you, and you are the only one to whom I will give this information. Kind of a rough quote of what was in that, that note. Somebody found out that Gillen was Dollar Boy, and it ended up in Oberösel at our Military Intelligence Service Center. Well, the commanding officer then sent me on six days temporary duty to Nuremberg to get this important information from Lai. <laughs> and, that, and that trip to Nuremberg actually had to be authorized by Justice Jackson. I went to visit Lai in his cell and asked him what the information was. Oh, he said, uh, it's much too long. I can't give it to you orally. I have to write it down. Well, that meant that uh, it would take some time for him to write it down. I didn't want to stay that long in Germany, in Nuremberg. So I asked Colonel Andrews to just uh, let me take some paper and a pencil to him and let him write it out, and then I would come back when he had it written, when Lai had written what he was going to tell me. So I went back to Oberursel uh, until a, almost a week or two later. I got permanent orders to go to Nuremberg, which is the last thing I wanted. But uh, Colonel Andrews had been able to pull the right strings, and I ended up in Nuremberg on permanent assignment. His plan was actually, his revelation was his plan for the reconstruction of Germany with himself in charge. Uh, he would stay uh, in the prison cell willingly, providing, of course, we would fix it up a little more comfortably. But he would direct the operation of, of rebuilding Germany and um, commerce and, and transportation and everything else. And he would bring back as his assistants all the Jews who had been exiled, who left uh, as refugees and were now elsewhere, the United States, Great Britain, or wherever, and bring them back and, and uh, have them help him in the reconstruction of Germany giving back to them the property that had been seized, their assets, and thereby making concessions and uh, making up for the bad feelings that uh, the German government had. And because he said uh, the biggest mistake that Hitler made was the persecution of the Jews, who could now uh, help in the Reconstruction. That was his plan. And I was summoned to Justice Jackson's office and that was the only time I had eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversation with him as I translated that document, or the, the high points of that document to him, in about six or seven pages. And, of course, he shook his head and said, uh, that's ridiculous, you know, this, this could never go, and never fly. So it was my job then to go back and tell Lai <laughs> that his plan was not acceptable to the uh, Allied authorities and uh, just forget it. Well, he, he just uh, went into hysterics. He just threw himself up uh, against the wall of his cell and stretched out his arms and said, well, in that case, you, you might as well shoot me right now. I, I have nothing to live for. I don't even want to stand trial, and he just carried on. But on the 25th of October, as I recall, I was a duty officer that night. And uh, about 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, the alarm went off. I was summoned by the guards. The guards could not go into a cell. They didn't have any keys. <clears throat> Consequently, the duty officer had the key that fit all the cells, the master key. So I came running when the guard summoned me and opened the cell and found Lai. Um, They did an autopsy on him, and they did found that uh, one of the brain cells, the lober, uh, was, was injured as a result of that crash during World War I. And it was defective, which had affected his, his outlook and his behavior, as well as his voice.